Hey folks, welcome. It's Friday, so that means it must be time for Talking Zed. Hello, Zombie Nation. How's everybody doing in the quarantine? I hope you're well. Three months on the couch, and today I got to work on a main title sequence for a feature film, and three months on the couch prepared me for nothing. The body is aching. And I'm also sad to say, folks, three months into the quarantine, this is actually my real hair. Not, not joking. We got rid of all the, uh, all of the uh, blonde in the hair. So I get to uh, present to you my quarantine hair for your approval. But hey, you didn't come in to hear about my hair. You came in here to talk to somebody from Z Nation. He's been on before. Um, he was so popular, we have him back, Skyping in, zooming in, into the Zoom all the way from Utah. Please welcome to Talking Zed. It's Alex Yellen. Hey, guys. Hey, Alex, how are you? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm good, so you're in Utah. You are working on a film, as you always seem to be doing. You are the second hardest working man in showbiz. Tell us what you're up to. Uh, behind James Brown, of course. Uh, and uh, what, what are you working on? And uh, tell us about, about how things are going for you up out in Utah. Well, I can't. I can't tell you too much about what I'm doing doing at the moment. Uh, I will say that it's a uh, it's a project that uh, we're experimenting with all these new uh, COVID safe protocols, okay. and uh, I'm quarantining with a uh, with a cat with a crew and a cast, and hopefully uh, we'll make something cool and fun, and uh, I'll be able to tell you about it a few episodes from now. Fantastic. And, and you've been out there for a while to, to quarantine everybody. I mean, where, what are you guys in the process? Don't tell me the name of the film, but where are you in the, how, how are things going in the, in the process so far? Uh, we're still in pre-production. Um, everybody uh, was tested before they came into, uh, voluntarily tested before they came into the hotel. Uh, they were quarantined in their room until their test was negative and one, then they're allowed to uh, begin attending meetings and doing prep work and, uh, and scouting around for the locations. Most of the film is being filmed on site. Okay. Um, and uh, we're still wearing masks and sanitizing everything and maintaining social distance. It's a very small cast and crew and the script has been written to accommodate that. Uh, and our only point of contact with the outside world really is uh, food delivery. Right on. Right on. Um, and um, last time we had nothing, nothing to do with the pandemic. It's a totally normal story, but we're Using all this, all the best safe best practices for safety and uh, health. Right on, um, and it's um, it's nothing mega creature related or any kind of zombie related. It is not. It's a it's a normal drama, normal ish drama, as normal as we can make it. So last time you were on the show, we were talking about your work at Asylum and how that led to working as a DP on Z Nation, um, and you've done uh, forty five. 50, 100, how many films did you do for the asylum? I think, I think it ended up being 40. 40. I think it was like 40 on the dot. 40, all right. Um, and we, we did like a kind of a deep dive into your, um, your uh, film credits, and we looked at some stuff way back in the day. Um, I was thinking that I would look at some of the ones that were like kind of uh, well-known, kind of like a, like a little mini hit, I guess you would say. And one of the ones that, um, you and I first connected on was the Mega Shark versus Giant Octopus movie because my, my buddy Steve Blackheart was in that, playing like a sub commander or something. Yeah. And um, I wondered if, uh, if we could roll a clip from that. So this is Mega Shark versus Giant Octopus. 10 million years ago, they were frozen in combat. Hairs of this flesh didn't come from anything mechanical. Moon's organic. You name one thing in that ocean that caused damage. There's something big out there. Now they're loose. Gorilla in Manila. We'll get them to kill each other. It rises. its eyes. Like. Still closing! Lorenzo Lamas, Deborah Gibson. We're dealing with a menace. 
Mega Shark versus Giant Octopus. Holy! <laughs> it's so good, man. Um, tell us a little bit for folks who don't know these type of movies, the the Asylum model. Um, how fast you guys were moving? Uh, you shoot a whole feature in how many days? How many how many days of prep? shooting and, and a guest post to, to come up with a completed film? I think, uh, I think that film had, uh, was early in the asylum's model of two weeks and that two weeks of prep and two weeks of shooting. And they were, I mean, so that doesn't include some of the early stuff with the, that a, that a producer is doing in terms of, and the director in terms of like getting the script to where it needs to be, but sort of from the point where anybody other than the producer and the director comes on board and that's sort of your, your uh, production design, costumes, uh, uh, cinematography, all that stuff comes in about two weeks ahead of filming and then you have two weeks to make the movie. And then I think the post time, turnaround time on that was like maybe 10 weeks, including visual effects, which is pretty insanely fast. Mm -hmm. um, I can't, I'd, I'd have to, I'd, I'd have to double check, but I think it was from start from start of prep to out the door was something like 14 weeks. And at this point, how many of these type of movies had you done personally? Have you, you DP? Uh, and I think that was my, well, let's see. Um, fourth or fifth. I think that was my fifth movie at that point. So I had done Universal Soldiers, I am Omega, 100 million BC, Street Racer. So I think it was the fifth one. Um, and, and I said it was a bit of a hit for Asylum. Um, that sequence of the giant shark eating the Golden Gate Bridge was very iconic and was seen a lot. I think it was even on one of the posters, maybe, the Japanese poster. I mean, it was an answer. Mega Shark versus Darren Octopus was an answer to a Jeopardy question. I feel like that's how you know you've made it as a sort of pop culture. It's like that, or they talk about you on NPR. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, it, and it was a, it was sort of a surprise hit because it was a very uh, inexpensive movie to make, and uh, it it kicked off sort of it sort of rebooted two genres, the uh, the shark genre that had sort of slumped a bit, and sort of in the wake of uh, Mega Shark, not only did it breed I think three sequels, but I think in the wake of that you got all of these other like mashup shark movies. It was Sharktopus, Dino Shark, you know, Avalanche Shark Attack, three, you know, Two-Headed Shark, uh, all these, like, I mean, Sci-Fi Channel did their own Shark Week based on just giant shark monster movies that uh, Mega Shark kind of rebooted that genre. And then the versus genre, which is like, let's just take two, the two most ridiculous giant things we can think of and we'll have them fight and that'll be the movie. So you mentioned, I think you mentioned every title except Sharknado, because that was mm -hmm. an one as well, talking about a Jeopardy question. I think when you have a president mock it on Jimmy Kimmel, right? That's, he said, Obama was the Sharknado of presidents or something like that. Mean tweets. Um, yeah. And uh, did you work on the sequels to Mega Shark? Were there, were, there were Mega Shark sequels, and I wondered if you had your hand in any of those. Uh, I worked on three of them. I worked on two, three Mega Sharks in total. So it was Mega Shark versus Giant Octopus, versus Crocosaurus and then versus Mecha Shark. And then there was a fourth one that I wasn't involved with. I don't think there was a fifth one, but I'd have to check to be sure. That's awesome. Um, and well, it's, it's funny that you brought up the something versus something, which became a thing, uh, because I, I, I brought uh, a clip along from another of yours that was uh, done by the Condalic brothers, Airplane versus Volcano. Uh, John, let's run that clip now. This is a trailer for Airplane versus Volcano. Ladies and gentlemen, the captain's turn on the fasten seatbelt sign as we make our descent to Kauai. Excuse me, we're actually repairing the land. Do you mind bringing your seat forward? I think a submerged volcanic shelf has surfaced. Joseph? We may be experiencing some technical difficulties. Radio is malfunctioning. Is everything all right? He's not breathing. Uh, he, he's gone. United States Air Marshal Kirkland. We need the pilot out of the seat. What's going Everybody, on? just remain calm. What is that? Oh my god. That's a volcano! Mayday, mayday. This is flight 7389 requesting immediate emergency assistance. Only a matter of time before this thing rises and it's big. Get out inside now! Everyone must evacuate the beach. What are you doing? Can you fly this? Hang on! Those people. 
people will die up there if you don't do something. Then they're dead in the air! We are gonna face this thing head on. Oh man, I don't know why those trailers make me so happy. Um, I just have one question for, and, and, and I know it's, it's, it's an odd thing to ask a story question in one of these type of movies, but the guy who was like on his cell phone was doing a mayday. Like, well, how was he, what was the, what am I missing there in the trailer? That he's sort of like just talking into his, his earbuds. I'm pretty sure he's like the onboard tech uh, he was like the onboard tech guy. Got it. And that was like, and he had like hacked the radio. All right. So like Addy Carver can just talk to Citizen Z through any kind of device from any technology of any time. Just go with it. Got it. I think that was, I think like the radio had gone out and he was like now the point of contact with, uh, with like the military ground station. Got it. Um, was that another 12 day shoot? What can you tell us? What can you remember about the production on that one? I think that was also, I, th I do think that was also a 12 day shoot. Um, they, uh, uh, that was actually, I, I love the absurdity of that premise. That may be the most absurdly premised film I've ever worked on. Cause it's like, okay, I get, let's take two giant monsters and have them fight. But it's like, okay, versus a natural disaster. Yep. Um, I think uh, it's, 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 they might've gotten the idea from, uh, 2012 Ice Age, when there's a, a line of dialogue that say, you're declaring war on a glacier. <laughs> so it's like, hmm, maybe we can fight an inanimate natural object and call that a battle. Uh, but they, they, we, we, uh, they built an airplane set inside like the asylum's warehouse that was, it was like one section of, of, of uh, economy class a small, like three seats worth of first class and a cockpit. And most of the movie was filmed in there. And then we, you know, we went on location for a couple of exteriors and, and uh, the sort of military command center. But uh, we, I mean, I was really surprised at how much we were able to do in that little set. And because we owned it, we could, you know, destroy sections of it and, and, and take pieces off that we would not have been able to do at sort of the higher end airplane sets that you can rent out in Los Angeles. But uh, no, that was, that was super fun to make. And it's all, I mean, it's a lot, so much of it is practical. I mean, it's obviously the airplane flying around isn't, but you know, we didn't do a ton of special effects inside. We did a lot of wire work, a lot of lighting effects, a bunch of makeup effects. Uh, no, they, and the, the Kamalik brothers are so influenced by Sam Raimi that if you actually watch the film, there are a lot of homages to sort of like Raimi's style oh. that, uh, that, that, was, that were really fun. So do you remember uh, what year that was and sort of like where that was along your career path? Uh, pretty sure that was 2013. So that was one of my later, that was one of my later films because we did, uh, Z Nation started in, in the spring of 2014. So there were only a couple, that was sort of, I will call it the twilight of my asylum feature career. Uh -huh. uh, I'd have to think to remember what we did that fall, but uh, that winter was Blood Lake, Attack of the Killer, or Attack of the Killer Lampreys. A classic, then, of course, yes. I know that. A classic. Yep. And then the year after that was uh, Three Headed Shark Attack, and I think that was the last Asylum movie I ever did. So this was, this was late, in the, late in the game. So one of the things I wanted to do was um, look at the stuff that you directed on Z Nation. So we, the last time we talked, uh, last time we were on the show, we talked a lot about your DP work and, and the look of the show and that type of thing. So you, you, came into, you came into Z Nation, you're the DP for all of season one, and yeah. helped to establish the look and the and the the process for making that show, but you had already had your foot in the water as a director at Asylum before you left. So, I, I want to talk a little bit about Battle Dogs and where that falls into the timeline. So, in Battle Dogs, I, I think was 2013 or was it finished in 2013? Did you shoot? Uh, it? We shot it in 2012. Okay. So we shot that. Yeah, we shot. Oh, that's right. So we shot that in like September of or like. August, September 2012. It premiered in 2013. And then I did a non-asylum, another sci-fi film that was non-asylum. It was much, a much like smaller scale 
uh, like, you know, haunted house kind of story called Finders Keepers. Okay. Uh, so I directed two movies before I started, got involved with Z Nation. Um, but Bad Dogs came about, so I had been, I say I did, uh, you know, 40 Asylum movies, but that was just as a DP. I had done a lot of second unit work and, you know, I sort of got this reputation as like a cleaner. So when there were these, there were a couple of productions that had like fallen behind or it had some technical problems or like, you know, lost, you know, like the production vehicle, like the picture car broke down and they lost half a day of filming or whatever. So they, you know, it's like, we'll, we'll get a camera and bring in Alex with, you know, we'll give him like an AC PA and like a couple of extras and like go out and make something like just like fill in the gaps. Right. Right. Uh, and so I got kind of a reputation for just directing these, you know, splinter unit sequences that like, you know, a lot of the stuff wound up in, in the trailers for these things. And uh, they were like, well, you, you know, you, you've done this well, why don't you just direct one of these movies? And so there were, they, there were a couple where the, you know, the scheduling didn't quite line up or like, you know, the project wasn't quite a right, wasn't quite the right fit. Um, and then Battle Dog, the opportunity to direct Battle Dogs came around and that really like, uh, I really connected with that script and the concept. And uh, we were, you know, we, they found a, an airport, everything was built around the airport, even though it's a very small part of the film. But like being able to film the, the opening sequence of that in an airport was like so central to where we filmed it. Uh, we filmed it in Buffalo and they were so excited to, to have us there. They still talk about Battle Dogs as like the film that kicked off the Buffalo film, like the Buffalo film renaissance. Wow. And now they're like, you know, now they're doing, cause there hadn't been anything in Buffalo for years. And now they're doing, you know, Quiet Place 2 there. So, so I'm gonna back up just a little bit. So you are shooting splinter units, you're the cleanup guy. Um, one of the things that's important for those, these type of movies is they have a certain runtime, right? There's, so you're coming in and when people are getting behind, you're, you're solving problems. And was there a thought at that point from you that you wanted to be directing? Were you communicating to them saying, hey, I wanna, I'd love to direct something if the, the right thing comes up? Or did someone at Asylum say, hey, you're doing so great, why aren't you directing? Or was it sort of a combo of both? I don't you know if you can remember. Um, I, didn't, it, the, I didn't start the conversation. I mean, I started the conversation from a second unit perspective. Absolutely. It was just, and it wasn't a, it, I didn't frame it as, look, directing is my passion. It was, hey, look, I think I do, I think I could really help out, like be helpful and, you know, clean up some of these scenes. And even on, you know, shows where I was still the DP, there were sets where I would light the set and talk about the, uh, you know, the camera work with the operator and the director and we'd rehearse it once and then go through the coverage. And I'd tell, you know, I'd give instructions for the, for, for the gaffer and the operator. And then I would just go off and do second unit while, you know, take the camera and go do second unit stuff while the unit was filming. Cause sometimes, you know, when you have to do, you know, 15 or 16 pages in a day, and there's action and there's a bunch of extras. Sometimes you just don't have time if you're all working in the same space at the same time to knock off that much material. Uh, sometimes it's just divide and conquer is the only way to get through it. So, uh, so I had suggested the sort of second unit thing, but again, from more place of uh, being helpful. And uh, they, I mean, they sort of approached me initially about taking these sort of cleaner, cleaner roles and then about uh, directing and well, I mean I, I jumped at the opportunity but yeah. uh, you know it's it's it fell into my lap a little bit and I think every direct every like aspiring director out there is probably really upset hearing that that it was like oh you, you you're the guy who didn't spend his entire life like working at being a director uh, I mean in some level I did because there's a lot of directing skills involved in being a DP uh, and that's certainly, you know, it's not something I, being a DP isn't something I want to give up, but uh, I have worked very hard to develop my directing toolkit and my skill set and, and, you know, to focus on the areas where I don't, you know, the areas of weakness in my own, you know, uh, abilities. So things like sound, music, uh, directing performance, things that I wouldn't naturally have uh, practice doing, you know, by being a DP. So uh but yeah so it, it, the opportunity was was offered to me more than it was chased and uh i have been more proactive about pursuing directing opportunities since then 
Well, let's let's do this. Um, I I gotta tell you, I saw Battle Dogs. I think when it came out, and it was on a, a sci-fi movie, and then I found it in Blockbuster when there still were Blockbusters. Um, and I think I tell you, it was the last movie I ever rented at a Blockbuster was Battle Dogs. So it's always got a place in my heart. Um, John, let's roll it. This is the trailer for uh, Sci-Fi Channel's Battle Dogs. <laughs> Mutating into a canine form, at which point she began attacking those around her. We do not contain this lupine virus. It could infect the entire United States within 72 hours. Let's see what these things can do. Do you want to use those things as weapons? It's nothing more than a common thug with a gun. It's a sacrifice I'm willing to make for the country I've sworn to protect. There won't be a country to protect! Eradication is your only option. Nothing spreads like fear. You are this, mother! Battle Dogs. Dude, what a great cast. Um, I, I mean, I know you've worked on these movies with, with main folks, but to be directing Dennis Haysbert, what is your, what's your biggest memory from that? Tell me what it was like working with him. I'm, I'm just going to fangirl and just listen. Uh, so, so first of all, I had zero say in the cast, none whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, you know, on most of these films, they're, you know, they, there's like, they get these lists of like actors who help with, you know, foreign sales or like what's the, you know, dollar value attached to a specific actor. And Dennis was the first, like Dennis, once Dennis came on board, I don't know what the offer process was like, uh, but once Dennis came on board, all these other dominoes fell. And so it was, you know, it was Craig Sheffer and Ariana Richards and Wes Studi and Kate Vernon. Uh, and, um, who am I forgetting? Uh, I'm forgetting somebody. And it's What's gonna come African American gentleman's name who's, who's riding in the car. He's got, he's, he's like- Oh, Paul Duke great. was in it? Uh, yeah, Paul Duke played the president. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the, so first of all, Haysbert was an absolute joy to work with. Like he could not have been more professional and more fun. And he, so two things, one, he, uh, uh, there was a day where we were just, like he'd been called in early and there's nothing an actor hates worse than like coming in early and then waiting around because you're not ready for them. And it had just taken so long to get set up that morning and get, you know, the, get lit and loaded in and everything in place. And Dennis finally comes to set and just, I apologize profusely for keeping him waiting. And he says, no, you pay me to wait. The acting I do for free. And I don't think that's his line. I think he poached it from somewhere else, but it's a good line. Um, and there was another day when things were getting very tense on set. Like it was just stressful and we were behind and a scene wasn't working quite right. And he just started, uh, he just dropped in without, you know, on a dime into uh, Pedro Serrano. Just dropped into his major league character with like the Caribbean voice and started telling jokes and everybody laughed and relaxed. And then we got along with the day. Like he had a very good like set sense of how to be a pleasant person on set and also very professional. So. Well, uh, I've never worked with him. I met him once briefly. Uh, Gregory Itzen is a very good and dear friend of mine. He played Charles Logan on 24 and he was the one who killed Dennis Haysbert's president, whatever his president, his name was. Uh, and, and so they've always been linked. Uh, on, on 24, and, and I've, I've heard Dennis has such a great um, uh, reputation. Uh, oh, here, I've got one more good Dennis Haysbert story for you. Uh, which was, so we did, we filmed uh, at an airport uh, inside a helicopter. So the, they flew in a medic alert helicopter, like a, a air ambulance, and they flew it into the airport we were filming at. And, you know, we, on the ground, we film it, film the interior of the helicopter as if it's in the air. And then, you know, but you always have to like, you can't never really look out the windows or if you do, you have to green screen it. But they had to fly this helicopter back to their home airport, which was, I don't know, 10 or 15 miles away. And we were like, hey, can we just tag, can we just ride along? And like, we take Dennis and just ride along and film out the window. So we actually have some shots of like Dennis with the ground moving below that are practical. And, you know, it'll save us all this effort in, in post. We don't have to do all these visual effects. And the pilot said, absolutely, we'd love to do this. Dennis said, I have to make sure it's okay with my insurance. And so he calls up his Allstate agent. <laughs> no way. And uh, he calls up Allstate, he's like, I can't remember the guy's name, but it was like, Bill, <laughs> they want to take me up in this helicopter. Am I in good hands? And 
for all I know, it was a fake phone call, but it was amazing. That is everybody cool. died. Everyone was like, he said it, he said the thing. <laughs> That's so awesome. Um, you know, we had uh, Dan Merchant on last week. And, uh, and Merch was talking about uh, the first episode that he directed, which was that Mad Max Road Warrior one. And Still the most complicated episode we ever did. He gave you such high praise. And you're talking about the helicopter, and it's reminding me of that. Um, because there were so many big action sequences or things that he had in his head. And he said, Alex Yellen would sit me down and say, that's great. We can do it that way and that way it'll take us three hours, or we could do it this way, and get the same effect, and it'll take 15 minutes or whatever. And were, you know, he, he sung your praises because you made that episode happen. And, and, I, and I said at the time, and I, I think that your experience, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, your experience coming through Asylum and working on all these uh, small budget, fast turnaround films, where you're kind of figuring out ways to make it work. Uh, it's kind of your Swiss Army knife that you, bring, that you brought on sets and Z. Oh, absolutely. And that's, I mean, you know, I think, I think low budget skills are very translatable up to bigger budgets because you sort of really understand how to budget your time and where to put your resources. And you say, not everything has to be done 100% for real. Let's, you know, we can cheat. If we cheat these, you know, six shots, we can take that time we save there and devote it, devote it to making these six shots that much cooler. So, I mean, from that episode, the best example is uh, the like quad chasing, the, like the, uh, the quad bike raiders jumping on the muscle car. Mm -hmm. So that sequence, like that sequence took half a day, which on a seven day show is an enormous amount of time to spend on what I think was like two and a half minutes of screen time uh, out of a 48 minute show. Uh, but, and so the compromise there was a lot of the, a lot of the stuff on the truck you know, we're sort of looking up to the sky and moving the camera around rather than trying to drive the truck. Like the number of shots where the truck is driving that with the cast on it is so small. And that's again, like what are the things that we can make look good, make look believable uh, without having to move the truck, which is just getting that truck moving with people on it is so time consuming because everybody has to be safely harnessed and secured or supervised by a stunt person you have to do all the safety briefs. You have, like, you really have to do that stuff slowly, step by step, and safely. And if you don't do that, I mean, that it's it's you can't. You have to safety first. So, um, uh, so yeah, it's it, that's definitely something I feel like I bring to every show now is and, and I think how all problems are prioritized. On that episode, I was noticing too, you know, if you don't get your shot and you move all these vehicles, it's a caravan of vehicles, then you gotta back them all up and all the time it takes to do that, right? Safely and correctly and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's a, um, I, I was watching it was exactly what you said, how many shots were low, low angle up to the sky, shaking the camera so they could, you know, move around on that vehicle when I was assuming it was actually steady and, Right. You, I mean, look, you tie it into a cut to some nice wide shots of the, of every, of the cast and all the vehicles driving along and it's totally believable. I mean, Michael Bay does the same thing. If you watch his car, like the car interior shots from all of his movies, you will not, you don't see anything moving outside. It's the windows are whited out. The camera shakes a lot. There's a lot of interactive light and they're quick shots, but uh, most of those shots are the car is totally static. And then you cut to dynamic outside crazy action stuff. Hey, when we when we first started talking about uh, Battle Dogs, we were talking about Buffalo and how folks there still talk about the the show. What was it like shooting there? Uh, how accommodating was the city? Why did you guys end up going um, beyond the airport? Was there anything else that Buffalo provided uh, for the show? Well, so uh, I mean, the fact that the uh, the airport was why we went there in the first place because I think our uh, line producer Chris Ray had driven all over the East Coast to you know, two dozen airports that it was supposed to be JFK, but he'd driven to like two dozen airports trying to find somebody who would sort of let us take it over for a couple of days. And he found Niagara Falls Airport, which is modern and slick and looks nice. And you can, you, you know, totally plays for the parts of JFK that we needed and gets like four flights a day. And they're like, we're willing to divert passengers to this, you know, auxiliary baggage claim 
and like, you know, we'll block out just a couple of check installs at the far end, which are, like will direct traffic around your filming and really make it work for you. Uh, and so everything else we're like, okay, we got that, we'll make everything else work. But Buffalo has a great downtown and they got some of, some of, some architecture that's very evocative of New York City. Um, I think one of the Sharknado movies did some New York City stuff there also, but it's just the, there's so much less, there's so much less traffic, there's so much less uh, sort of active pedestrian attention. And it's also, certainly for Battle Dogs, it's a post-industrial city and there's a lot of, uh, you know, buildings that have been retired. So we filmed in their train station uh, that has been completely decommissioned, but you know, sort of had that Grand Central Station kind of architecture. And it's just such an incredible, beautiful, you know, dramatic building that made such a fantastic backdrop for like the quarantine. Like in the script, it was like a tent city out in a field. And uh, we saw that I saw this train station and I got to look inside and I was like, let's forget the tent city. Let's just let's just get cots. And instead of putting instead of trying to make 60 tents, let's just get 100 cots. We'll lay them out. It'll look like a Red Cross shelter for people who were infected with this werewolf virus. And uh, we'll do that. And it looked, in my opinion, so much better than what we would have been able to achieve with, with tents. And, and Buffalo gave us, I mean, they were so happy to have us there. They really gave us access to a lot of things like public services. I mean, for, in our, and for the cost of our like sort of location sort of uh, permit fees. And we were able, they were willing to, you know, close, you know, direct traffic around one of the bridges we wanted to film on. We were able to use the command center, like the command center at the police station, uh, you know, do some, do our like down to like that shot of the car crashing and flipping over. That was you know, inclusive in our original permit. We didn't tell them we wanted to do that originally. We sort of like came up with that during the, during the pre-production process. Wow, that's awesome. uh, I mean, that's one nice thing about going to smaller film centers is you don't necessarily have quite the same crew base. So you end up having to bring some people in, but the community is so excited to have you there and they're willing to, you know, really work, you know, work double time to give you what you want and put the best foot of that particular town forward. Well, it sounds like you are talking about another small town uh, where we shot for five seasons on a zombie show. Uh, Spokane was very, very accommodating as well. So thank you, Buffalo, for, for uh, Battle Dogs. Hey, hey folks, um, if you're just joining us uh, in the Zoom, uh, I'm talking to Alex Yellen, uh, DP for all five seasons of uh, Z Nation and also a director on the show. Um, if you have a question, you can hit the Q&A button, which is at the bottom of your screen. Hit that Q&A button and the question will pop up and we may or may not ask it on air. You can talk to Alex in real time. Um, and also, if you like a question and you see somebody else put a question up and you went, man, I should have asked that question, let's give it a thumbs up and move to the top of the queue. Um, so let's let's switch gears. Uh, we did a deep dive into the history of Alex Allen. Now let's get into the Z Nation. You, you come up after season one. As I said, Alex, you did a great job on season one. Um, we'd like to have you direct an episode. We have a very, very simple episode. It's just going to be two people talking in a room, just dramatic lighting, uh, you know, uh, and, 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 and you are like, I will take it. Um, if, if only. If only. They come up to you and say, we have the craziest episode of the season and it's gonna be zombies that are plants. And you say, <sighs> yes. <laughs> hey, let's look at, uh, this is uh, from season two. This is episode four, batch 47. Greenhouse is the vaccine against the zombie virus. On the next Z Nation, it's a potential herbal cure. It's a suicide mission. Side effects include headaches, oh. violent tendencies, yeah. and turning into a plant. <laughs> Z Nation. That's 47. Um, what a job was done on that set. Uh, tell me about the process of getting ready to direct your first episode for, for Z. Um... So, I mean, the biggest, the biggest thing right off the bat was, you know, creating this whole world because it's something that uh, was really outside of the, you know, out, like nothing really existed for the inside of these greenhouses. It's like we had to come up with entirely new concept for building the set because it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, you know, something we couldn't reuse stock elements from earlier seasons. There were no practical 
there were no like practical greenhouses that we could, I mean, active greenhouses that would work that were like overgrown. Uh, and, you know, we'd never done plant zombies before. So it's inventing a whole new visual world uh, to film in. And we had many conversations about how to do this. Uh, and also it was, even though it's the fourth episode, it was the second episode we filmed uh, when, when, when uh, the season started. We did the pilot. Um, and also because uh, John Himes was directing episodes one and two, and because the episode three, which Merchant directed, the Wagon Train episode was so big and needed time, uh, it worked out well that I could direct uh, episode four between one and two, and then the sequence just continued from there. Uh, but so we started those meetings about how are we going to make this thing a reality, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks before we ever got to Spokane. And there were a lot of different ideas about can we do CGI and, um, you know, how much can we do practically and what department? I mean, I think the biggest challenge was just which department was going to be responsible for making vines. Uh -huh. and, uh, you know, it was like, well, they're attached to actors, so it's costume, but they're, you know, it's not traditional costume, so it's makeup, but there's also set stuff, so that's art, but they have to like pull people, so that stunts. Uh, I think the interdepartmental collaboration that was required was uh, unlike almost any other episode we did for the entire run of the series. Um, but we had some really cool concept art that one of our visual effects uh, wizards, a guy named Casey Sargent, did for us. And that really got the ball rolling. Um, and once we sort of had a, a concept we were looking for, we did like a very, a very uh, simple layout of like the lair. Oh, I should also say, we found some practical greenhouses. Uh, it was basically a shutdown greenhouse like nursery operation that somebody like had been closed and uh, some thieves had come in and ripped out all the copper wiring. Oh, so wow. I don't know if you've ever been in a greenhouse that isn't ventilated in the summer, but uh, we went into these greenhouses for the first time. The, the ambient temperature outside was 70 degrees and we took a thermometer inside that uh, ping, like it, it went to the top of the scale, which was 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And so it was hotter than that. So it was above 130 inside when we, when we first saw it. It was like, okay, we cannot subject yeah. that through, especially if somebody's wearing a creature suit yeah. uh, to that environment. So we had to bring in people to like rewire some of the vent ventilation fans and we connected them to our generator. And I think we got it down to like 90. I think we successfully got the interior of the greenhouse set down to 90. But um, I think the greenhouse, it, like the, I, somewhere or other, I still have like the layout diagrams, but I think it was like a main tunnel that was like 16 feet long with a T at the end of it. And then there was a second room, then like the throne room with the big Fido zombie was, the Batch 47 zombie was behind it. And everything was just like, let's just make one really cool, uh, let's make one really cool hallway that's really overgrown and put a couple of like flats in that we can use as turns so they can sort of twist and wind their way and we'll film it from different angles and just make it feel like this maze. And that's, you know, really a really focused limited set that we can do really well. And I mean, they really delivered. I think the way they ended up making the vines was taking like black plastic, like plastic sheeting, twisting it and hitting it with a heat gun and then stretching it out and then like spray painting it green. I think that's what the majority of the vines were made of. So watching that episode, not knowing that, it felt like there was practical, actual vines mixed in with the, mixed in with, was there, were there some real things kind of in your foreground? Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. There's, there's actually very, very little CG in the greenhouse. Almost all of the almost all of the set, almost all of the foliage is practical. Well, we have a we have a clip. We have a a, a large uh, sequence, a sneak peek from this episode. And John, can you uh, run that clip for a second? It's like some kind of giant shop of horrors.
Watch it. Oh. 2216. Hey, you should be dead. That won't work here. They're all interconnected by the vines. You can't kill one without killing all of them. Do this and get the hell out of here. Doc and Tinke, you guys harvest the leaves. Murphy and I will get the seed pods. Dude, that's so good. It feels so real and 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 gross and disgusting. Um, you know, we've had a couple people jump into the the the, uh, the chat room. Uh, there's there's a gentleman named Carl. I'm, I'm not sure if I get the last name right. Schaefer, is that right? And and he was asking, where did you guys get your seaweed? Is there any left over? So, I mean, the person with all the Z-weed is Russell, as Russell Hodgkinson. He is, so the whole, the whole premise behind that episode, and, and it started uh, in the episode before, was this idea of, of marijuana that's grown in zombie compost. And that's like this, the, the greenhouses are really just a, a massive weed, uh, weed uh, growing operation. And that the scientist running the place uh, has also tried to make a cure sort of as a side project. Uh, but Russell took the, the Z-Weed thing and like developed it into a brand. That's and awesome. I mean, like his, like his t-shirt at the conventions is, is Z-Weed. And that's like very much, I think at one point he was like partnering with a, with a Washington state marijuana business to like release a Z-Weed, uh, like release Z-Weed as a strain into the like, general uh into the market but i'm not sure exactly if that ever happened <laughs> that is uh, awesome. so so if you want the z we'd call russell because he's the one who's gonna have it well I've, I've heard from some fans that uh doc is one of those guys that we should probably get on to onto the talking dead um I, we have somebody from uh from spokane zooming in uh matt davidson's asking hey alex uh can you speak about your experience and challenges filming the find murphy interactive online game especially the camera rig. So first of all, I, I, I'll acknowledge Matt Davidson, who is in that episode, although we, did, we, we, very, we brushed past him in that clip. He was in the background. Matt is one of our most accomplished zombies. Uh, actually, no, I'm going to say most accomplished zombies. Uh, he went from uh, like perfect zombie extra to uh, full-fledged cast member by the time we got to season, end of season three, I think was, uh, he joined the, he joined the cast proper. Um, but, uh, so yes, for, for season two, we did a, a special promotional interactive game that was supposed to be first person. And so to do these kinds of first person things, you'll see, you know, there, there are some pretty intense rigs out there, but it's like, okay, Let's do ours the Z Nation way. So we literally took a, a DSLR, it was a Sony A7S, which we had been experimenting with because it's very, very uh, sensitive and low light. It really performs well when there's almost no light. So there, you know, there are short films out there that were shot under just under moonlight that looked like they were shot during the daytime. So we took this uh, very sensitive camera, put a very wide angle lens on it bolted it to a baseball helmet and uh, I, you know, I wore that helmet and then, you know, ran with the cast through this gauntlet of uh, zombies, which again, uh, Matt was a part of. Um, and the, there's a great, I wish I had shared the picture. There's a great picture floating around out there. It was uh, me with this rig on that I think is still my, the most liked thing on any social media platform that's involved me ever. Uh, just because it looks very cyborg -y. Um Alex, I've known, but, for, I've known you for like eight to ten years, and I, I've never heard this story. That is amazing. I, uh, that's an awesome. That's an awesome thing. And 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 um, you know, we we are going. We're about we're about 
15 minutes from the end of the show. And um, I've been so busy listening that I forgot to promo uh, uh, for next show. So if you wouldn't mind, Alex, I'm just going to throw it to a promo next week. If you like what we're doing, if you like what we're doing, June 19th, uh, we're going to have this guy, uh, Carl Schaefer, is going to be joining us here on Talking Zed. Um, come meet the guy who helped create the show. He's executive producer, showrunner for Z Nation, and the prequel spinoff, Black Summer. He'll be here in the Zoom. Uh, Carl Schaefer, next week, everybody, uh, come back and, and talk Zed with me. Um, we were talking about your uh, camera rig. We were talking about uh, the Fido Zombie episode. How many episodes of Z Nation did you go on to direct? Uh, I went on to direct eight, but, but one more thing before we get off this interactive thing, and for every fan of the show, by far the most fun part of that whole experience was uh, the, the moment in that interactive game when Addy walks up and hands me the Z-Whacker and says, take this. And now I, I get to be like Addy with the Z-Whacker walking through this place batting zombies and that anybody who's ever watched the show has to have like fantasized about how awesome that would be. Let me tell you, the experience more than lives up to your imagination. That's awesome. Hey, Alex, um, we had a fan who wanted to pop in and just ask a question to you live. I was wondering if that would be cool. Go for it. Uh, um, John, if we have that person standing by. Um, I think I'm, did well, they show up? If the video works. You know, can you, me? Can you hear me? It's the oh, hey, Carl. hey, Carl, can you hear us? Yeah, I hear you guys. Wait, let's see. Start video. Hey. All right, now we just got to get your mic working. You know, this is what they call building up an introduction. Unmute there. How's that? Spence, you're on. Hey, I made it. Hey, long time. Hey, yeah, Alex, how you doing? I'm doing well, Carl. How are you? Peter, hi. Good to see you. You as well. How was your quarantine? Uh, good, good. I have uh, been laying low and uh, staying out of trouble. That's always. Waiting, I'm waiting for the zombies to make their entrance. You know, it seems like we've we've got the murder hornets. Yes. Um, it seems like the the next thing. Um, 2020 is headed to zombies. It's only a matter of time. Well, about half of my, uh, uh, I've been rage tweeting a lot, and about half of my tweets are, uh, you want zombies? This is how you're going to get zombies uh, <laughs> from something that's going on that's crazy. Well, we had Dan Merchant on last week, and I said, hey, uh, we've got uh, a pandemic sweeping the, sweeping the globe. We've got riots in the streets. And then I asked him if the president was dead. You know, I just wanted to get the trifecta from the, from the first episode. Uh, and he reminded me that that was actually his voice uh, doing that that uh, that alert. Oh, the uh, opening, yes. Uh -huh. This is a uh, um, extinction level event. Extinction level event. It feels like we're living in an episode of Z Nation in some ways, isn't it? It's actually season six that we're living in of uh, Z Nation. <laughs> it's sort of the prequel, like back to the beginning. Right on. Uh, right on. I would, say it's, I would say it's marginally less, it's not funny enough to be season six of Z Nation, but you did get the, the, the cat videos and the memes right. Well, <laughs> kind of like uh, uh, the idea behind Black Summer, one of the reasons it's not funny is it's sort of the, the uh, apocalypse evolves, right? And as it evolved, it got weirder. But at the beginning, it was serious, uh, dead serious. So I think we're at the serious part now, um, or at least the ironic part. Um, and it'll be getting weird soon enough, if well, it's not already there. Well, I'm, I'll tell you, some stuff's gotten pretty weird, but, you know, we were just talking to Alex about the uh, Fido Zombies, which was the first episode that he directed, um, and I was joking that, that the conversation went something like, hey, Alex, we have a very simple episode for you to direct, uh, and then he said, oh, sure, and, and took on this thing and then realized that uh, there was all sorts of uh, uh, plant zombies and, and vines and crazy stunts that had to happen in the vines. Um, what can you tell me about Alex Yellen and what he meant to the series um, as a DP and as one of those guys who kind of helped cr create the look of the well, show? I mean, I think one of the things he did was make the show possible. Um, you know, it was, uh, uh, Alex was there for every minute of shooting and I think provided a lot of the continuity 
from director to director um, and, and um, as well as being one of our best go-to directors. Um, but I, you know, we, one of the things we did on our show was we gave a lot of people their first shot at directing. Um, and uh, you can't really do that unless you've got a really strong DP at the center of it to kind of, you know, provide the continuity and to, to help plan the shoots and to, to prep the shows with the director and, and, you know, give them a realistic view of what's possible and what's not really possible to make in a day. And, and also on top of just being a normal DP, uh, Alex is actually operating cam a camera um, sure. virtually for every shot, you know, so um, you're really seeing Z Nation through his eyes in a big way. Um, and I think just the, uh, the physical stamina of, you know, carrying that camera rig, um, because again, it's, uh, the show is virtually all handheld. Um, and you couldn't do this show on dollies and cranes and the way a normal TV show shoots. Um, really the only way it was doable was very minimal lighting a lot of, it's almost all available light with just a little bit of fill or some, you know, effect lighting um, and, and all being handheld. Um, so, you know, you're, you're seeing it literally through his physicality and his eyes. And, and um, you know, when we'd bring in another DP to shoot his days, you'd see about halfway through, they're sitting on an Apple box shooting a lot of this stuff because it's, it was just physically daunting to do, you know? Um, and, and I think a real, uh, um, an amazing accomplishment, uh, frankly. I will say though, all that running around does keep you, it does keep you in shape and it keeps you feeling young. You get to the end of the day, you like, you feel like you earned your paycheck that day, so. Oh yeah, you, I mean, you were, you were like, you'd come in always like first, at the beginning of the season, you're, you know, you're like 15 pounds up from the last time we've seen you, you know, a clean cut and everything. By the end of the season, you're like this ripped guy that's, you know, uh, with a big beard and, and um, sunburned, you know, uh, unbelievably sunburned. Uh, it I, was, I, I did do the apocalypse beard before it was fashionable. <laughs> yeah, you no, know, it was, it was a physically challenging show, you know, and, and even though the Fido Zombie episode was a tough episode, I there really wasn't an easy episode that we did. We never because every week was we were reinventing the wheel every week, and and every week you know the writers would throw down some gauntlet like, oh, this week we're going to be in a junkyard that's 135 degrees, you know, full of scrap metal for the whole thing, or we'll be out in the desert, or we'll be underground, or we'll you know, uh, or we're in. Uh, 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 a bunch of uh, greenhouses that are, you know, 130 degrees inside. Um, you know, it was always, uh, the crew would be about this far from mutinying, but they wouldn't because they could see, uh, particularly once they got to see episodes, they could see how much that meant to how good the episode would come out. And they felt like they were a part of something special and they were willing to, you know, jump in and uh, sort of, you know, deal with the, the difficulties of every episode uh, just because just they were survivors, you know, in a way. Uh, I think that's how they took it. Well, I think that's so true, Carl, because like being on the set and, and being around these folks, people really cared about what they were doing. I mean, you could, you could sense it being, being part of the crew and in, in the limited capacity that I was at. Um, and I do want to, I do want to talk to you uh, about that, uh, that camera rig that we always saw Alex with the, uh, with the, with, the, with the camera. Merchant was on last week and mentioned uh, that I should remind Alex that whenever uh, he wanted to mess with them, he would he would have Alex hold up the camera, which is about 60 pounds, and he'd be flexing like this. And then Dan would say, oh, wait, wait, just one more thing and walk over to an actor to give one more, you know, one more tweak just to mess right. with him. But can you speak to, uh, I think people, we were talking about with the asylum, how fast they shoot. How fast was Z Nation put together? A, a, a typical episode. I know that it was longer in the beginning, and then when you got toward the end of the uh, four and five, uh, it was a truncated shoot schedule. How fast was one episode shot for the show? Well, generally, we had five-day episodes, um, but there was a couple of tricks that we used, because, and, and that's, a, that's an hour drama. Most hour dramas shoot in Seven days would be a low budget show. Eight or nine days is kind of typical now. 
you know, there was, I saw an episode of uh, um, Better Call Saul the other day, which was no bigger than any of our normal episodes. And they shot 19 days uh, for a single episode of TV. And I'm going, what on earth were you doing all that time? We generally, the bulk of our episodes were shot in five days, but it was um, a couple of things that we did was one, all the directors were from within the series. So on a typical show, a director comes from the outside, they show up a week early, they get five days of prep, you know, and then a, a, a week of prep, a week of shooting and a week of post, and then they go away. Um, but our shows were so complicated and such tricky little pieces, we would use directors from within the show, like Alex, you know, like uh, um, Jason McKee, our visual effects supervisor, uh, like Dan Merchant, who's like our, you know, post supervisor and producer um, and director, who were, they were around for the whole season so that we could break up the prepping of a show. And a lot of times these guys were also, uh, um, uh, writers of their episodes. So they're really prepping the episode from the time they're writing and thinking about it and knowing where they're going to shoot everything. And then we would break the episodes up. So yes, they would shoot the bulk of the episode in their five days, but then they had second unit days. You know, they would get a day or two of second unit that would be picked up here and there uh, because they're still on the show and working um, to do it. But it was still really challenging to you know, do it in five, 12 hour days with essentially no overtime um, and a very small crew. And, and it was because, uh, you know, because of people like Alex that we were shooting so fast and so light, we, you know, we carried a very small lighting package. We carried very few lights. We didn't spend, the actors would always be shocked when we'd bring an actor on the show. I remember Emilio Rivera, who's fantastic from, you know, Sons of Anarchy and, and, uh, um, has a million credits and and he had said he had never shot anywhere so fast he was shocked because they show up and the normal thing you do is you know the actors come on set you rehearse with them for 15 20 minutes and then they go away for 45 minutes back into makeup and and hang out while the the camera crew is lighting and stuff but on our show it'd be like the actors would show up we'd block the action like really quickly once with them. And then we would start rolling. We would be shooting, you know, the first rehearsal and they're going, wait, wait, you're shooting already. You know, and like, yeah, actually that we that we printed that first one. Here goes take two, you know, and, and um, just keeping it moving that fast and, and being very nimble. And, and I think Alice can speak to the fact that we gave the directors a lot of leeway and how they shot things and, and how to stay on schedule and, and um, you know, uh, most TV series now, you get a big thick binder as a director when you show up the first day that has the style of the show and that, you know, you need to get a, 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 a wide master, uh, uh, a, you know, a single and a two shot of every single character uh, in every single scene so that the, you know, the writer producers can edit it later any way they want. And, you know, we basically would be like, get it in a water and get the heck out of there, you know, um, and, and that, that sort of forced a lot of creativity um, on the set and, and encouraged the directors to do really creative, interesting things and to just get it in a single shot or, um, and to be very cinematic about it. Well, Carl, one of the things that I've always thought about um, Alex on the show, because I knew him years ago as a DP who did a film for me, is uh, somebody who who really would get this type of a show, and obviously he he was a voice from the beginning. You know, he has the distinction of being the director of the final episode of the show. Yes, that's not an accident. <laughs> yeah, and and you know, I wanted to show a clip from that episode. Uh, I don't want to get too too to bring us too down, but uh, it it's called uh, season five, episode thirteen. This is the end of everything. No prisoners, charge! Fire, fire, fire! What was it you wanted to tell me? The end of everything. You're at season five. I know that the, the, the uh, fans are always asking about season six. 
where did you where did where did we leave off? Where's was season five the end for you, Carl, or was there a season six, a season seven, a season eight? Uh, there, that's the constant thing that I get now that I've started to do Talking Z. What where was where, where? What about season six? Well, we I mean we had a concept that we wanted to do, which was going to kind of re um, relaunch the show a little bit uh, with a lot of the same cast, um, but the idea was that we would shoot. Um, it was it, it, sort of what I was pitching was Generation Z, which was to focus on some of the younger members of the cast. And um, Murphy, Warren, and Doc would be uh, back in Numerica, which would be kind of a home base. And Warren was going to be the sheriff. Murphy was going to run the bar in town. And Doc was going to be the mayor. Um, and... Uh, the George and Addie and 10K and some new younger characters we were going to add were going to go out into the apocalypse every week so that we would have, you know, uh, a third to a half of the show would all take place on home sets, essentially. Um, and then part of the show would be a mission where, you know, our guys would get a radio signal from somewhere out in the apocalypse uh, and go out on a rescue mission each week uh, into the apocalypse uh, and, and um, you know, sort of concentrate on some new characters and dealing with, you know, what restarting society at that point and seeing what happened. Um, and, you know, we were, we were all ready to do it, but, you know, I think the powers that be were kind of tired of the asylum by then, <laughs> I think is what happened. So, uh, um, Carl, thank you so much for, for zooming in today. I know we were trying to get you in and had some technical difficulties. Um, I've enjoyed having you on so much. I would love to have you on next Friday, the 19th. I would be thrilled to be there. Thank you so much. Um, you again, you next week on June 19th, uh, same Zoom time, same Zoom channel. Uh, come back and we'll be talking for the entire episode with Carl Schaefer. Uh, but before we leave today, I'd like to uh, thank Alex Yellen for, for coming on board again. And he's our first two-timer uh, on Talking Zed. Uh, one of the things I love to do is end with passion projects. Uh, last week, uh, we ended with uh, Dan Merchant's uh, documentary, uh, God Save Us From Our Followers. Uh, and Alex, um, when we got back from Spokane at the end of season five, uh, you were working on a passion project called Daruma. So tell us a little bit about that project, where it stands, uh, and then we're gonna head out of this episode with a little bit of a video from that project. Uh, Daruma is originally my wife's brainchild. It's based on some, uh, loosely based on some, some people that she is close to, uh, and deals with a, uh, dysfunctional family drama around a paraplegic lead character. She wanted to do a story, uh, that could be relatable to anybody. And it's a, uh, a paraplegic guy who's down on his luck, who finds out he has a kid from a one night stand he never knew about. Uh, and he takes custody of the child but realizes he's not uh, emotionally equipped to, to parent and enlists his next door neighbor, who's a double amputee, to help him drive her across country to live with her grandparents. And uh, hilarity ensues. But uh, the most important thing about this movie was uh, that we wanted to cast the two lead roles authentically. I've never seen a movie, a, a full length feature film, starring two lead actors with disabilities that is not about their disabilities. This is a story that could be anybody. You could replace the two leads with, with character from, characters from any background and it would still be true and relatable. But uh, we really wanted to find, we found two great actors, um, a, uh, actually a quadriplegic lead named Toby, uh, Tobias Forrest and a double amputee named John Lawson, who very conveniently is our tech supervisor on Talking Zed. Um, who's a multi-talented fellow. Uh, and we, we raised uh, $60,000 in initial funding and we have some additional commitments and we're, uh, we're continuing to raise funds and planning to shoot this uh, conditions allowing by the end of the year. That's awesome, congratulations. Hey John, let's play a clip from Daruma. What do you want? Hi, my name is Kelly McNeil and I'm the writer-producer of Daruma. And I'm Alexander Yellen, I'm the director of Daruma. 
The Room is a dark comedy that features lead actors with disabilities. Go on, my name is Tobias Toby Forrest, and I am an actor who plays Patrick. Hi, my name is John Lawson, and I play Robert. This project's extremely different from other projects I've worked on because the two main characters happen to have disabilities, and the two main actors who play those characters also have disabilities. I was inspired to tell the story because of a tragedy that impacted my own family. People loved the idea. They thought, what a great idea. Who are you casting as your leads? And when I told them, they were like, you're casting two disabled actors. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, good luck, kid. The director and producers only wanted to cast real actors with disabilities in the role. I had no idea what was out there. I've not seen uh, authentically cast roles before, certainly not with the depth that this script calls for. And just the process of looking for actors has been incredibly eye-opening and incredibly gratifying. There's less than 2% of characters in film and television with disabilities. Out of those 2% of all the films and television shows, 95% of those roles are done by act able-bodied actors. This is what the disabled film community has been talking about for years. This is an opportunity. This is a chance. This is a chance to change things. It's my first opportunity to have a starring role in a film. And for an actor with a disability, that is so rare. Being able to portray a character as a double amputee that has nothing to do with being a double amputee. If movies like this, who are willing to take a chance and employ actors with disabilities, if that can be done, then hopefully huge budget movies can do the same exact thing. You will not find a more committed and dedicated group of people working towards the success of this cause. And what we really need is your help to do it. The way a Daruma doll works is when you get one, you make a wish and you color in one eye. When the wish comes true, you color in the other eye. So we're making a wish to you. We are going to color in the eye of a Daruma doll and we're wishing that we get full funding for this film. When we get a green light, we're gonna color in that other eye. All contributions to Daruma are tax deductible. We need you to help us make this movie. Thank you guys so much for watching. And if you're seeing this, and if you are a filmmaker with a disability, please reach out to us. We are accepting resumes for the crew. So feel free to reach out. Thanks, guys. Um, I appreciate it. Carl, thanks for zooming in. Um, I think we still achieved what we wanted to do, which was a surprise. Yeah, Alex. thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, it was a little late, but I got there. No worries, my friend. We'll have you on next week, and we'll talk in depth. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Alex, thank you again. You are a, a fantastic friend, and thanks for your – you kicked off the first episode, and like I said, you're our first repeat uh, guest, so thank you for doing that. Good luck on your film in Utah, Carl. He's, he's working already. He's in Utah working. I mean, he's always working. Always he's working. always doing something. All right. And hey, you check your email for the, uh, for the after party information. Um, John should have sent it your way. We'll, we'll connect in the Zoom after this. Thanks for watching, everybody.